Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. In our last podcast, we discussed the power and spirit that sweeps through groups during mass movements. Our conversation stayed in the archetypal and philosophical levels. Today, we're bringing our hearts and souls and minds to the intimate human suffering of what is happening right now all across the United States. We're here with our friend Fanny Brewster, and we will confront how we can't breathe, finding our voice in the face of violence. It's so good to have you here, Fanny. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah. Welcome aboard. Dr. Fanny Brewster is our friend and our colleague and a fellow Philadelphian. She is also a member of the Philadelphia Association of Jungian Analysts, where the three of us uh, are also members. So uh, it's so lovely to have her among us again. We did a previous podcast with Fanny on the racial complex. Fanny uh, lectures at Pacifica University. She is a leading voice in developing Jung's ideas about raciality She occupies a relatively unique position. She is one of the few Jungian analysts of color, African-American Jungian analysts. I think, Fanny, I think there's only, what, one other African-American Jungian analyst? There's one other female and two men. Okay. So uh, we so appreciate you joining us to discuss this particular moment in our collective. Thank you, Lisa. I also have to add, Fanny, how much uh, we all have appreciated your books, and listeners, no doubt, will appreciate them also. And they will be um, on the show notes uh, under references right at the bottom that they can take a look at the books you have written. And I know you have a book that you are writing. Yes, I do. Thank you again for inviting me today um, as a follow-up to the show that your last show that you previously previously did. And I think, you know, the introduction today of talking about breathing breath and air um, is so important. It's so important to the movement that has taken place and caught fire uh, across the world. You know, and I was surprised to see how many were actually out in uh, Europe protesting yeah. what has happened. The numbers were amazing to me. So um, George Floyd's death has created um, a joining, a global joining of us in how we are actually breathing together. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to, if I can, begin with um, his last words and have us go from there. It's my face, man. I didn't do nothing serious, man. Please, please. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man, please, somebody, please, man, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, please. Man, can't breathe my face. Just get up. I can't breathe. Please, a knee on my neck. I can't breathe. Shit, I, 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 w- I will. I can't move. Mama, mama, I can't. My knee, my neck. I'm through. I'm through. I'm claustrophobic. My stomach hurts. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. Some water or something. Please, please. I can't breathe, officer. Don't kill me. They're going to kill me, man. Come on, man. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, sir. Please. I can't breathe. These were the last words of George Floyd, and it has 
um, these words have given us an opportunity to breathe more deeply and to express our um, sadness, our rage, our unhappiness in so many different ways um, across the world. So there's this this way in which um, African Americans have had such a tortured experience of life uh, coming over from Africa through the Middle Passage onto the plantations and uh, into this 21st century. And one of the most painful ways that we have experienced as a cultural collective is the, the cutting off of us at the throat, cutting off air in that place. As we talk about air today, I want to bring in a poem that I wrote. It was published in the Evening Street Review a few years ago, and um, it addresses one aspect of racism that has lived in our community and in our Africanist consciousness for a very long time. I'll, I'll read you this poem. It's called The Bridge. The Bridge. It's the water that first catches your eyes. You barely glance at the simple bridge arching itself across the North Canadian River. Sunlight shimmers on water, holding an intense glow that says it must be late morning. Trees on both sides of the banks are in full bloom. Men, women, and children stand on the bridge, some bending over the railing to watch what swings below as river water flows soft as tears. If you look closer, you can see what photographer G.H. Farnham caught reflected on the river's water. The two photographic downriver views of this scene are historical and known as Farnham's number 2899 and number 2897. But he was late. Hundreds had already seen the image he made famous that day. What hangs off the bridge deck, catching the photographer's eyes on May 25, 1911, was not such an uncommon sight, and yet the standing bridge viewers probably thought themselves lucky to be captured in the frame of the camera's eye. The photographer caught the trees, the shiny river, the blossoming riverbank shrubs, and all 35 men, six women, and 17 children who came to see the lynched Laura Nelson and her 14-year-old son, L.D. That bridge from that day in that place, Okima, Oklahoma, is no longer there. It has been replaced by another, but this is the one we see raped mother hangs across from her son, face one another, rope tight around their necks, caught forever in the shadow of the bridge. Mother and son move with the breeze. The sun shines. Their shadows fall across flowing river water. That bridge from that day in that place is no longer there, yet this is the only one I can see. So this is the way in which our cultural collective air has been cut off. So when we um, see the passion of the deep breathing that we are experiencing collectively around the world. We know that it comes from this place of a loss of the air, a loss of breath. And we are, for the longest time, 
even with abolitionists trying to have enough air to protest what has been a huge social and horrific crime against humanity since the beginning of the days of stealing our bodies from Africa. Fanny, you use the word crime, but I'm thinking that atrocity is more fitting. Absolutely. And um, I so appreciate you making this link between George Floyd and, and this image of the lynching and the air being cut off and taking us back historically to the slave trade, which, which was a violent cutoff of so many things, including culture and family relationships and freedom and religion and spirituality. The brutality is simply unspeakable of the most basic human right ever is simply the right to draw breath. And I'm uh, like Lisa, I'm really resonating to how deep the roots of George Floyd's murder are in African-American history. Yes. So when I talk to African-American friends and colleagues and people in our community, allies in this movement for social change, it's, I think we, we, I know we carry this archetypal remembrance of the, not only the relationship of master slave, because it has happened, not just with people of African ancestry, it's an archetypal pattern that we also carry all the grief around being cut off, as Lisa has said, you know, and not cut off only in the airflow, uh, just in that way, but cut off in that way so that we could not survive. And so this is what we have more and more in the 21st century, like um, this power that pushes up against all that we have accomplished as a a culture, all that we intend for ourselves, like trying to cut us off. And it shows up mostly in the killing of African-American people by those in law enforcement. So then we have to think about, as we are defunding police and think about ideas around um, perhaps deconstructing police forces so that the intent is truly to protect and serve people of color, that we are not cut off from those services because of our ethnicity. You know, I'm also wanting to rest into this place of, um, you know, hearing Fanny so vividly described in your poem, these or the pathos of your reading of George Floyd's last words, this brutality, this unthinkable brutality, as Deb said. And I guess it it feels so easy to denounce it and try to separate ourselves from it and do this thing that the ego does of, that's not me. And how important we know it is as Jungians to say, Oh, yes, that is me. I have that in me, too. And to just acknowledge that we're, we all have that capacity for brutality within us and that we deny that that is true at our peril. So it's this really important work of leaning into the shadow places to make space to admit that to ourselves, that we're all capable of that at some level. And I'm thinking about, you know, if most people have not uh, literalized it and engaged in brutal acts, 
but there's a brutality in not knowing, in ignoring, denying, simply not living in that place where we have to see it and we have to feel it. I'm so aware of of how George Floyd's death has enabled us to see what brutality looks like and has moved us, I hope, into a new place, a different place of how oh, we are that also of, of the empathy, the injustice, and the, the terrible suffering that is the result of our collective brutality in so many overt and unconscious ways. We must become conscious of our brutality. Yes, and I think one of the things that I notice with the protests protesting that's going on in the protesters, there's signs that uh, address silence, right? And what as white silence is a form of violence. Yes. And I think that's what Lisa is referring to and Deb, what you're saying, you know, like we see the horror of a man being killed in front of our eyes and there's no denying that. There's no denying it. And I think that's been a part of the maybe fantasy before. The fantasy is, oh, well, you know, did that really happen? Or was the police officer really intending that? Or was that person really meaning harm, meaning harm to that person, uh, the Black person? And then there's a justification of it. Well, you know, if they hadn't been doing what they were doing, you know, well, if he didn't have a... $20 bill that he was trying to spend at the store or, you know, so there's always some justification for the taking of a black life that does not merit at all what the black person was doing, which could have been just running down the road as Aubrey was, you know, black while running, black while shopping, you know, black while dancing or driving in your car. Um, so we have so many episodes of African-American people being stopped and being cut off um, when they were not doing anything wrong. Because the idea is if you are living and breathing and black, you are doing something wrong. And I think that this is a part of our unconscious racism in America, in the American psyche. I do believe that it's still there. It's something that we're dealing with on an archetypal level. And that has to do with this idea around opposites and creating us as a cultural collective as shadow. I think that that is still operative. And if it wasn't, then we wouldn't be engaging in the activity, the horror that we are in terms of wanting to cut off the air of people of color and caging us as we did with brown children. Like that's still, these, um, these overt actions would still not be happening if on an, on an unconscious level, we weren't still caught, I think, in a racial complex, as I've called it. Jung called it a color complex, but not looking at it fully in the same way that I'm looking at it or have attempted to look at it. I'm aware of, you know, really how hard it is for us to talk this morning. I'm so appreciating your voice, Fanny. The feelings, the issues, the suffering are so big that it almost feels impossible to bring words to it without the words themselves minimizing the depth and breadth of these issues. Yes, I think, I think that's true, you know, and um, when we initially talked about doing this kind of podcast, what came to me was the word was air, because it takes your breath away. George Floyd had his breath taken away, like so many of us. Laura Nelson, who was lynched with her son, 
1911, the poem I wrote about, so many of us have had our breath taken away and it leaves us speechless when we are confronted by the horror. It was horrific, the Middle Passage. It was horrific. And Jim Crow was horrific. And it's her, the plantation life was horrific that my ancestors came through that plantation system generation after generation since arriving in Charleston, South Carolina, aboard a slave ship. So it has been horrific for our cultural collective, and it hasn't ended yet. And over the centuries, we have tried at different periods to um, give voice in different ways to the horror of what it has been like. And in this 21st century, we are still doing that. We're still trying to have enough deep breathing and breath to be able to say, we can't breathe. We're not there yet. And actually, I find it amazingly wonderful that so many people have come out in protest and have said, we can't breathe and we're not going to have this anymore. Fanny, can you share more with us about how those images of worldwide protests are moving you and how they're moving through you? The first thing that strikes me is that there are so many young people there. And I am so, so glad and happy to see them. I see that there are so many different ethnic groups of people there. And I love that that we are coming together to have this unified voice that says, we don't want this and we are not going to have this. And I'm really glad for the technology that makes law enforcement officers to wear cameras that say, that provide ha us with having a witness because it's the technology as a part of this protest that the protesters are also using, because my understanding is that it was a young woman, 17 years old, who actually filmed, um, did the video of George Floyd's murder. A young woman, a 17 year old, who shot a video of that. And so we are having witnesses through this protesting that we may have never had without the technology. And I'm really grateful for that. And so I see this protesting as incorporating um, so much of what our 21st century needs, young people, people of different ethnicities, technology, and raising our voices, and also providing the visuals, um, this street that is now a Black Lives Matter plaza, in Washington, D.C., in big yellow letters, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. And to have the mayor of that city say, hey, we're going to do this. And we're having these letters on the block where the church was that the president went out and posed with a Bible, an upside down Bible, um, which says something. Sure does. I sure does. And we're going to have the visuals. We're going to have the auditory. We're going to have the tactile. We are going to see things. We are going to bear witness. We are going to have all of our senses engaged with our beingness. And I want to say that I think that that is actually a true depth psychological stance. You know, I really believe that bringing us back to death psychology, like that's that stance. Every part of us is alive and present, and it doesn't matter how much we're suffering and how much sorrow we have, that we also have the um, vision to be able to hold to the ability of going through something rather than wanting to avoid it and say, oh, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, that is uh, such an important 
issue and point that you're bringing up, Fanny, of that when we can witness, you know, and now we have the technology, we, we have to come out of denial and feel and see and lift things up into consciousness with, with all of the excruciating awareness that something like uh, the filming of George Floyd's death uh, brings forward. We, we can't deny it. Witnessing is, I think, the, a huge word and concept that relates so much, as you say, to depth psychology of bringing something into full consciousness of, oh, my God, this is real, this really happened, and it, it connects with all the awful history of people of color in this country, around the world, too, gives us a window into how massive these issues are. And we cannot cut off from them anymore. So I notice in the conversation so far, Fanny, that I'm being very quiet and turning in upon myself. I'm so aware of the the pain and the wound around all of this. I feel the tears thrumming in me, but I also feel a quality of helplessness, of confusion in myself, of feeling the incredible delicacy in our conversation, being concerned that I will take a misstep, that I won't have the right words or the right way to hold what you're sharing so soulfully. And it causes me to, to kind of lock up, to not know what to do. It's like a, a different way of not having enough air, isn't it? And it's a way of shutting down and cutting off that airflow. You know, my thinking about that is that as American Jungians, we have had almost a century of shutting off our airflow in terms of speaking about American racism and developing a broader community to in, enfold and bring in people of color into American Jungian psychology. And so Lisa mentioned earlier how we have four African American Jungian analysts. And this has come about in this ex odd way. It's just odd to me um, because Jungian psychology has been silent in terms of American racism and and what Jung wrote. And we can go through the collected works. All of us here talking today have gone through the collected works. And we know what Jung has said in terms of Africanist people. And we have needed voices within the Jungian, American Jungian community to speak up. And they have silenced themselves, maybe because they have had feelings like Joseph is having today, like especially as white male, what do I say when I am often seen as the person, the collective, the African male, I'm sorry, the um, white male collective that has been such a, a maker of the horror that all of us in the American and American society has experienced. How do I have a voice? Where is my voice? Where do I stand? And I don't want to be hurt in anything coming back at me. Maybe I'm not entitled to have a voice. And yet everyone has to have a voice. That's the, the way I think that works. And I think, once again, I'll reference Helen Morgan, um, this British, my British co-author for the next book that I'm writing, in talking about our mutual as well as our diverse ancestry being both Jungian analysts, but coming from a different place in terms of um, ethnicity and culture. And she talks about that silence that has existed also in England around people of color and in the psychoanalytical community, this silence in the Jungian community, even there, 
the silence. And it's because we are stopped. We are stopped by Jung's racist language in the collected works. And we have turned our gaze away from looking at those words and being willing to confront those words. Because I think a part of it is we don't even know how to. We don't know how. And so having these kinds of conversations and giving breath to what we're talking about today means that we claim, like I said before, every part of that shadow that we can, every part that says, I don't have a voice. I'm afraid to have a voice. I don't know how to have a voice. I don't know the words. I don't know the language. We're learning the language of what racism and what raciality looks like in American Jungian psychology. We're just learning that. We're just like children. And I think of us as babbling, like we're, you know, when we're young, we we know one word and then we have a sentence that has like a but of a bunch of incoherent language and we don't they're just sounds right we may say cake and then because the kid likes cake and then we don't know any other words to say it's just babble no da, 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 and then we say chocolate you know and so to me this is how we're growing in terms of ourselves as american unions and so eventually we will have we will have full sentences and we'll have paragraphs and we'll have language that comes that recognizes the racism in some of Jung's work and how we can feel our way into having a voice. And I just, I just love Joseph that you said, you know, I'm silent. I'm not having air because I don't want to make a mistake. And I just, I don't believe that there are any mistakes. Everything that needs to be out there is out there. And if it's not out there, it's coming, it's evolving. So I'm, I'm so appreciative of you for having the courage really to talk from that place of silence and then to bring that air out into words. That's a beautiful thing, I think. You know, I remember reading once someone being asked to summarize Jung's psychology in one sentence, and the sentence that was proposed was, everything belongs, and that we have to make room for everything. And when we're so afraid of making a mistake, and it feels like so much is out of bounds, and there's only this very narrow Uh, margin of what we can say that might be acceptable and we're afraid of being shamed if we misspeak. It makes it really difficult to have this confrontation with ourselves, to have this confrontation with the culture, to have these conversations, to think about this. And I want to lean into this just a little bit more if I can. When I said before that some of what comes up for me is this need to you know, this real strong desire to separate myself from the brutality that you so eloquently portrayed in your poem, Fanny. But then I can feel myself say, no, you've got to turn and, you know, admit that that's in you too, right? Because it's in every single one of us. I think that some of the discourse around racism in, in the United States, in any case, is that we should as white people, we should be doing this kind of moral inventory and trying to purify ourselves, trying to expunge any racism. And there's a way I want to say that that's not possible. We can't empty out the unconscious. We can't get rid of our shadow. We can't leap over our shadow. We have to try to live with the consciousness that That is us all the time. And I think that some of the fear of saying something wrong is a very well-intentioned desire on the part of white people to not be racist and also to signal that we've done our work and we're not racist. When I, I think I'm saying, I'm not sure that that's possible. And maybe it's important just to make some space to be with that. I think I think you're right about that. You know, when when we as unions, like we know, 
um, complexes don't go away. Mm -hmm. Archetypes don't go away. Like we know that. So when I am thinking about a racial complex and developing how I might feel about that and how I am with that in terms of my own racial complex, I'm considering what you're saying. Like this complex is not going anywhere. And we see it on the collective level and we see it historically in present time and we see it um, in ourselves. So it's learning how to befriend the complex, right? How to consider our um, individual selves, looking at our own morality as individuals. And in that silence, right, internally, like being able to question and say, who am I with this particular matter? And how does it matter to me? And what can I do about it, if anything? Right. But it does come from that individual place and it's not going away. And I complexes don't evaporate and we don't make them disappear. And so that's that's where we are. And we keep, I think, bringing trying to bring consciousness to it. We try to deepen the consciousness around it. And it is by having Joseph say what he said and and bringing light onto that part of shadow like that fear and it's by us talking about it right now in this moment and acknowledging here's some shadow here and it doesn't just belong to him it belongs to all of us you know I had my own fears in writing the racial complex in writing that book right I had my own fears around that my own anxieties we have these pockets of anxiety and emotionality that has to do with our complexes. And I do believe Jung, when he said it, they do not go away. They don't. I'm just thinking how incredibly hard it is to really engage with shadow and complexes. And we, we know it in as individuals when we have to face something hard and uh, you know, maybe we could just sort of gloss it over or do it next week or be especially careful and nice about some difficult issue with someone versus um, let, let's reach out. Let's try to go there in ourselves and with one another, you know, n- not with the hope that things are going to be tidally resolved but that we will have meaningful connection, contact, and so it gets a little messy. Isn't that the way with relationships? They are messy, whether it's between two um, actual people or between me and me or between you and you. It can be messy. Um, Out of messiness can come something new. And we can go there with one another and in ourselves. Uh, the complexes don't go away, but we can engage them. And something we learn something. We become more by uh, stepping into it and connecting. I think there's also something of a gender issue here in the conversation as one man speaking with three women <laughs> that needs to be lifted up. And in our topic of finding our voice in the face of violence, that one of the things we're seeing in any number of the white protesters, um, male protesters, is that it's easier to rise up to a heroic stance, to, to shout, to become equally aggressive, to rise up as a hero. That part of the silence that I'm feeling in myself during the conversation is how to respond actively in the face of grief and sadness, because that doesn't warrant a heroic, fiery response. Yeah, it's very easy to go to the self-righteous place, isn't it? That That is an, an easy place to rest into that helps us skip over the grief. I don't know that all heroism, heroic impulses are self-righteous, just to not want to narrow it down to that. Mm -hmm. The heroic response can be protective. 
there are times when uh, wars of both ideas and wars of physicality require you know equal response if it becomes too one-sided of course you know there's a, there's a need for things to be questioned but i don't i don't think of the heroic response as being too narrow but again grieving um, grieving often i think for men uh, pulls them into a tight silent place i think we see that all the time mm-hmm. which doesn't mm-hmm. mean there isn't a response mm. but it may not be an outer response in the way that would be more familiar in the community of women and what i've noticed actually on television is that there are i've seen so many more men and men of color crying mm. as i've watched stories and them being interviewed about george floyd i have seen so many men crying i am really surprised i was really surprised by the number of men that i saw crying so i i know what you're saying it's like because for so long you know you have this image of men on screen there or in the life in the personal life where no tears are shed and grief cannot be um exhibited you know so i think it has become of course in our society like a way of stopping emotions yesterday at a um a gathering at antioch there were um a few men who talked about needing um a gun or needing a baseball bat or needing actual object or symbol to really feel present and to go out and to be living up to the expectation of the masculine mm-hmm. and feeling within themselves they had no other way that they could exhibit to be present right they couldn't take another remote experience themselves in another way except that way and so those have become symbols of masculinity and the question was why why does it have to be this way and those symbols of masculinity that are dominant in consciousness and it is an archetype but i think in times of tumult the archetype of the warrior rises in a particular way in all men and and that involves all of the symbols of battle that come forward that's so um i think really deep of of what we want to fight and what we want to fix i'm thinking in our political discourse when people are running for election they always say you know and i will fight for you we will fight for this or that whatever the specific issue is and i'm contrasting it with that phrase in your poem earlier uh and the images of men crying but the phrase was soft as tears mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the power of of our tears <clears throat> to to soften things yeah instead of the sort of hard edges of of the warrior uh archetype yeah and yet i think what we're seeing rise up in the culture is the warrior is the hero i think that the culture has been grieving the black community has been grieving and grieves over and over and over again so it's not for lack of grief but the explosive fieriness that's coming forward mm. i mean that is that is another archetype that's coming forward that again i think men relate to more easily and is experienced more as an activity where grief i think for many men doesn't feel like an action you know i'm wanting to just play with the idea of air there for a second cuz that was one of the one of our foci for this podcast and how that is often uh related to spirit and Joseph you're talking about this archetypal warrior getting constellated and what is the spirit that is alive in these protests obviously you know the images that we're seeing 
spirit has become kindled in these protests? In a way, I went to a literalization, but it may hold something as a symbol. Is For something to be kindled requires air. Fire requires air. Mm-hmm. And that there, I wonder if there's a hopeful note, and I'm building on what you were saying, Joseph, about uh, the warrior archetype, is that the spirit and the fiery spirit, that there's enough air here suddenly uh, to have fire of, of passion, uh, to, to protest and to, to make it obvious and visible, active. And, uh, you know, we can be critical about some of the specifics of how all that is, but just as an archetypal phenomenon, a channeling of archetypal energy, there is there has to be enough air for the fire to burn. And even that we use the word march, mm-hmm. which is a military term, there's many terms that we might say for gatherings of people, but that we culturally you want to use the word march. You know, lets us know that you know all the gods, all the gods of war, have an organizing influence, and there is a place for a righteous war, and by that I mean there are principles and values and rightnesses that are worth championing, that are worth going to battle for, and I think that's part of what's humming in this, as well as. So you said many generations of injustice and suffering and pain and horror. Mm-hmm. And, and that may be part of the, the strange short-circuiting impact of the image of the lynching that you had brought up in the poem, is where is the war-making? How are these people sitting there having a picnic or taking a photo op when someone's is being lynched and has been lynched. Where where is the spirit of war? It's missing. Yes. I want to read another poem, which was a part of this series from the bridge. And I think it addresses a different part of being a warrior, a different aspect of being a warrior, right? Maybe from the feminine, right? So I'll read it. It's called Someone's Child. The photographer's view of the bridge only shows men, women, and older children standing, viewing the remains. But that day they say that Laura Nelson had a small girl child she carried in her arms. They said she laid the child down on the bridge deck just before she was hung. One woman who was present told the newspaper reporter that the men who lynched Laura Nelson and her teenage son just walked away after the hanging, leaving the child on the bridge. She didn't say, rather the child cried. A different woman, an eyewitness, said the child was picked up and carried off by someone, a woman stranger, unknown to any of the local townspeople. A third story of that child's life, later told by a different woman to the newspaper, said that she knew a woman in a nearby town who took that child and raised that child and made that child her very own. So I think that is the warrior spirit of survival and of bringing forward the next generation, making sure that they live and caretaking. And I am appreciating the fierceness that Eros, that love can have of of that woman who said, I will take that child. That there is a ferocity in that of uh, that that warriors also can carry. 
Yes. And it does remind me of the women of the underground, right? Yeah. The women who gave life and limb and breath for the survival of so many others, right? People who needed to live so that we could so that we could survive. And that, you know, one of the signs of freedom for people traveling through the Underground Railroad was that there would be a candle lit and left on the window, right? So I think about that light and I think about the breath um, that could blow it out. And I think about the air that's required as you were talking about earlier, you know, the air that's required for fire to make fire. And there's this candle that's lit that says, this is the way to your freedom, to your survival. So, you know, that's just a remembrance for me as we fight, because it's always a fight. It's just a fight for survival, for freedom. You know, when you're a person of color, it's always a fight, always an engagement. And how can you become the best warrior that you can be and how is it showing itself up in the way that you live your life for the ancestors and for the descendants? So it works both ways, right? The reaching back and the moving forward. And Jung was so interested in uh, the telos, uh, the forward projection trajectory of where things were going. I was around in the 60s for civil rights uh, activism. And, you know, I, I thought the world would be a different place uh, because of Martin Luther King and so many others and the, the marches and reforms that were made. And I'm hopeful again that this will be a change, uh, not so much maybe in um, governmental institutions, although that's a plus, but uh, in our hearts, in our consciousness, that we need a new attitude uh, to toward differences and toward uh, reaching out to one another and honoring multiple realities. We do live in different worlds uh, and that there can uh, be a, some differences made from the, the tumult that is going on uh, currently, and so many people feeling um, the, the outrage and horrible injustice that was set off by George Floyd's death, but of course is much, much bigger than that. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Well, I'm feeling the need to complicate the story a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I, I just want to bring in this other reality piece that we've all been in lockdown for months as a way of trying to mitigate the spread of coronavirus and as um, moved as I am to see these images of people marching in great numbers all over the world, towns big and small across the United States. I'm also really worried that uh, this will be a, an opportunity for the coronavirus to take hold again and spread. And many of the marchers are African-American. 
So I, I just am holding that too. I'm just holding that too. That, that things are complicated. And, and of course, you know, again, our theme, our archetypal theme is air and breath. And of course, coronavirus attacks our ability to breathe. I guess my immediate response is that um, as a woman of color is that we are barely able to breathe as a cultural collective. You know, that we are always holding our breath, that we are always waiting to exhale, Mm -hmm. that we are trying to get enough air, you know, and thinking about survival. And so going out onto the front lines again is actually offering an opportunity for a deeper way to breathe, another way to breathe that has power to it, that has an energetic power to it, because barely breathing is not good enough. It really isn't. So that's how I look at it. Like we are continuously on the edge of losing our breath because that is how close death is and can be for people of color, especially men in our cultural collective. So this gives us more air actually in a way to be out there because mortality is so close. It's so close and it is for all of us. But when you're a person of color, it's like, this could be my last breath. If I go for a run, this could be my last breath. If I walk into a store, if I, if I have a a bag of um, candy that someone thinks is a gun, this could be my last breath. So it's so close. So, so what are we giving up by going out and sharing the air with people who are kindred spirits? What are we giving up, you know, or what are we gaining by joining in that collective? So Lisa, what do you you say to that though? Well, I I guess the image that comes to mind is of um, a a flint giving off a spark, right? So there's the air again, because you need oxygen for that. And, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, sort of why this moment, and I, I think it was a coming together of many things because Lord knows it's certainly not the first time we've seen horrific footage of uh, the killing of a black man. But somehow this is the incident that has lit the spark. And I can't help wondering if it's partly because we've all been in lockdown, because many people have lost their jobs because there's record rates of unemployment and it disproportionately affects African Americans. And so in some sense, there may have been an inevitability to it. And I hope that it's not the case that in the coming weeks, we don't see a huge spike in mortality. But I do fear that that could happen. And I suppose if I could orchestrate events then it would have been better for these protests to have happened before the coronavirus or perhaps after when it's less of a threat, whenever that is. And perhaps that just wasn't going to be the way it happened. I'm not the orchestrator of events. So I, 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 I think I'm just in the both and place. Yes. And I think, um, you know, these words, um, racism, is a pandemic. And so I feel that, you know, the and is um, holding that idea as well as wanting the safety and security of those who have gone out and are sharing that collective breath out in the world now in the world as protesters, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, um, lacking concern for them 
um, and thinking about how the virus could spike because of these gatherings, these huge gatherings around the world. And so my image is of um, almost like symbols of the pandemic of racism and the pandemic that we're experiencing and the bringing together of the protesters as you know, symbols um, just clashing together, like creating the the sound and the spark of that of that of this moment, and having enough energy, like those two forces, having enough energy to come together and merge, right into what is a movement. I have been thinking in this context about the Jungian. Uh, big, long word, enantiodromia, uh, which means more than that the pendulum will swing in the other direction. It means that one thing will actually start to become its opposite. And I'm thinking about the the, the pandemic uh, and how locked down, shut down psychologically, uh, the parallel is to oppression uh, we have been and our very powerful cultural history of uh, racial denial, shutdown, oppression. And that now, here's an enantiodromia. People are out. Uh, You're right, Fanny. Racism is a pandemic, as well as the coronavirus. And where, where might this take us? Well, I hope it takes us and um, being able to sustain this energy. Mm. Because I think every time there is a movement of this level of intensity, this kind of archetypal energetic movement, things do change. I received this morning a list of all, someone sent an email that had like 30 things that have changed since um, Floyd's death. And since people have become engaged in this way and one of those things is being able to say that in Minnesota, you know, that police officers were not going to be able to use a chokehold, you know, on individuals that they caught. Like that's a major change. So we want to see what changes happen on a practical level because the bodies are being attacked on a practical level. There is this archetypal energy and yet there's a somatics to this. There is the killing of the black body. And so these things have to come together, I think, in a not just in a visual way, but in a way that someone could look at it and say, yes, we have a decrease in the number of black people that are being killed in this way. We have to be able to say we have changed some laws and maybe they won't mean that much in the beginning, but in the end, in five years, 10 years, 30 years, maybe we'll see a shift. Consciousness also has to change, right? How do we perceive things like our, our talk about how we can, um, within our own Jungian community, because it begins at home, how do we create language? How do we develop language to talk about racism? How do we develop language to talk about what Jung wrote about Africanist people? How do we tolerate seeing this shadow? Is the light too blinding still for many of us to look at what Jung said? You know, it's like, let's, we have to do our homework. And our homework is doing these conversations and things like it, right? As well as anticipating change outside, out there, like the abolitionist movement did, because the abolitionist movement helped us move forward in the same way that Dr. King's movement did. And Malcolm X, I would mention, we haven't mentioned his name, but um, the fire and the passion of Malcolm X also helped us move forward in thinking and creating a black power movement that said black is beautiful, changing consciousness, right? So that beauty did not only belong to white, Beauty is black. We know that. But to be able to say it and to air it created all kinds of consternation, right? Which we're still dealing with in a way, right? In terms of skin culture. 
Fanny, when you brought up the abolitionists, it evokes the archetype of the ally, which I think may be a medicine in this moment. Whenever there's an enormous amount of tension in the personal psyche or in the collective psyche, the transcendent function is trying to respond, trying to create symbols to resolve the tension and to move things forward in their natural telos. And I'm finding the idea of being the ally to shift something even in my own tension, internal tension, and as a frame of understanding, as I think about some of the images, people marching and demonstrating across Europe are symbols of the ally. And, and that brings us a very specific feeling to those who are suffering and oppressed, and it provides an image of how to respond to the suffering that is being seen. And we can claim the status of being an ally. I am an ally, which then sets in motion feelings and thoughts and ideas that are particularly mobilizing. Yeah, I want to I want to lift that up, Joseph. You're bringing in this idea of the archetype of the ally and build on what you mentioned before, Fanny, with um, in particular the abolitionist movement, which was in in large part kind of nourished by uh, spirituality and and religious traditions. And of course, now we're back in the realm of air as air often is uh, associated with spirit, um, archetypally or symbolically. And I think that philosophical or spiritual traditions are channels through which archetypal energy can flow. So they can canalize this tremendous energy that's been unleashed into productive channels. And we definitely saw that uh, in the abolition abolitionist movement. And we saw that with MLK. And of course, there were many white allies that marched uh, with Dr. King in the 1960s. And I'm just maybe wanting to underline the importance of having a, a vision and a connection with spirit as we claim that position of ally. I think that's really important. I think it's because so much um, power came from the black church and so much power came from the spiritual practices of ancestors who had come from Africa and brought that powerful energy of the gods and the goddesses with them. And that sustained them. And I think in all those years and the transformation of those uh, spiritual practices brought from the African continent into the, via the Middle Passage and on those ships and the feeling of the gods, right, and the goddesses who sustained them through slavery and the plantations. And, and that was a part of the, the force that whites wanted to come up against. Like they didn't want that. They didn't want that force of spirit that um, slaves embodied and practiced that's another way that they cut off the air that's exactly right and it lived through those times and became stronger in the churches in the black churches and i think we still see that today we can see strength in the black church and dr king came from that black church you know and his voice was clearly that of a preacher. He was a preacher, right? Giving voice to what we needed. So I think that um, there's definitely been a place for spirit and of spirit in how we live, you know, and, and what we want to continue. And we want to be spirited. We want to be spirited, right? And we want that. We want that embodiment in, in what we do, how we live. And how we breathe. Right? <laughs> yeah. And that seems like a great place to end it for today. But 
Fanny's books are wonderful. Oh, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> and we will be uh, putting links to them in the show notes so that you can continue to read about her important work. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.